Welcome to another episode of Dynamic Thriving Podcast. I am your host, Mary Ann Pack, spiritual guide in all things life transformational. And today I have a special friend with me, Stevie Noah. Welcome, Stevie. Thank you. Excited to be here to help you out. Absolutely. Today's going to be a little bit different. We're going to turn the tables on me and Stevie is going to interview me so yes. that you can understand a little bit of my story um, because there's some shifts going on and I'm excited about them. So Stevie's going to help me share them with you. So I appreciate you joining me, Stevie. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So what would you like to ask me? Okay, I get the floor. So this is um, an exciting time for Marianne because yes, as she said, there's some shifts going on with her and her message and who she'd like to help. And so um, look, first and foremost, uh, I just want to say that, you know, we know that Mary Ann is very much a spiritual guide and an oracle for the many. So um, we're going to get to that story because I know that's going to be a juicy spot, but we want to kind of take take you back a little bit to how Marianne got to where she is now. Um, she's got a very special story to share. So um, we're going to be focusing a bit more on her religious background and her re religious upbringing because she is really working with these religious refugees at this time and um, has a really good juicy story to, to share with us. So let's uh, let's kind of Take, a, take us back, if you will, Marianne, take us back to the way that you were raised and where this whole, I guess, idea of spirituality uh, was sort of inserted into your life and, and the first people that kind of introduced it to you. Sure. Thanks, Stevie. Yeah. Um, I was raised in a very conservative, strict Christian um, denomination. Mm -hmm. And so in that, that was our whole world. You know, everything was about the church and our activities, the way we lived, the choices we made. They were all revolved around the church, the church beliefs, the dogma, the, um, the teachings of the church. So um, that being said, it was, you know, a very restrictive kind of lifestyle, um, pretty much you know, decisions were made for me about who my friends would be, where we would go, you know, when and where we did things, um, you know, what kind of television. It was just very, all those decisions were made for me. And I just wanted to have fun. I was this <laughs> yeah. little social butterfly that just wanted to flit here and there. And, and it seemed like everything that felt like fun to me and like what some of my kids, you know, whether it was school or even church was doing that. I was told, no, mm -hmm. that that's against our religion or that's not what we do. And I just didn't understand that. So that kind of puts a damper on your childhood, you know, <laughs> doesn't yeah. be good. It takes you away. It's almost like it takes a little bit of your childhood and your imagination away from you at that time. Did yeah. you um, did you feel a sense of connection to the you know religious side of it? Maybe more of the spiritual side of it. Was there any part of you as a kid that you really kind of felt an attachment to? I definitely, I definitely felt an attachment to the spiritual side of it. Um, I think I've always been a really spiritual person, even from childhood. And I always wanted to know why we believed things because I felt like there had to be some kind of foundation. Um, so, you know, in asking my mom different questions about things and, and sometimes she didn't have satisfactory answers for me. So, you know, I just kind of always held that in my heart. And I think, you know, as I grew and, and, um, you know, kept searching, but yeah, that spiritual side of me, I always loved what I thought was God, but then he just felt mean too. So yeah. I, you know, that's really confusing to a child to say, oh, he's, he's just ever loving and unconditional love. 
But then there was so much hate that I read about in the Bible and so much killing and, and things that to me didn't sound terribly loving. And I just can't, you know, I just couldn't put that two, those two together. Um, so I would try to hold on to the good part of God. And um, yeah. Yeah. And did you, was it a specific dom, uh, denomination that you were raised in? Yes, it was. Um, I was raised in the assemblies of God and okay. they were more, you know, some of the later churches are a little more progressive, but not where I was. Sure. So very, very restrictive and um, women have their place, men have their place, oh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Working with that within the parameters of that type of church, it's very much, you know, women are taught to be submissive to the man in their life, whether it's the father or their husbands or whatever. So women were not, we weren't, we really didn't, I didn't feel like. I don't know if it was said in so many words, but I think it was, you know, that, you know, you, you're not to be in a position of authority over any man. You're, you're, you're not to speak up. You know, I, every time I would speak up that I wanted something, you know, I'm told no. And I was always getting into trouble because I couldn't follow the rules. So, you know, punishment was very much a part of my life. And, uh, <laughs> So, I don't know. Yeah. No, I love. I, I I completely relate to this, and um, you know, I've got a. Just so you, everyone that's listening knows, I've got a background in this stuff too, and um, I can completely relate to what Marianne's saying. It's like you're constantly, you're constantly wrong. You're yes. constantly naughty. <laughs> it's yes. just almost like it just never ends. It's daily. It really is daily, and then you're always sort of walking that line, aren't you? For am I being good? Um, or am I going to drop off and, you know, am I a bad person? I'm going to go to hell. Like if I died right now, oh, absolutely. Am, I, am I on that line? So interesting. Now tell me a little bit about, um, you, you said that you would grow, you grew up in this environment and things kind of sort of got a little bit darker for you in the aspect of you had an uncle that was, not so great to you had older sisters and and that sort of right. thing can you kind of take us into that story uh, a little bit because it starts to probably make you question things quite a bit more in your life yes oh absolutely um you know i've just in the last you know short time ago I, you know i got to visit with my sister it's the only sister that i have left my parents are gone her older her twin is gone so it's just she and I, and we got to visit. And I finally got the courage to ask her what her childhood was like and about this particular uncle that in no nice way, he was a pedophile. Um, it, it's just, um, fortunately he didn't, um, you know, I don't know how you can judge severity of trauma, but it was dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I went to tell my mom about it, after I left their house for the weekend, they didn't have children. I always had to go over there and stay by myself. And the twins always got to go by themselves. And I think that's what there was a protection for them that I didn't have as a, you know, a single child going there. And, and how this, old were you at this time? Um, this happened when I was probably about nine or 10, um, you know, staying at their house. Nothing had happened up to that point, except this was an uncle that always wanted to kiss you in the mouth. We didn't kiss that way. Our family were cheek kissers. So to have this uncle, you know, this older man, and even just as a little kid, you know, wanting to kiss you in the mouth, it just felt like, what are you doing? You know, um, but it was never spoken of. None of this stuff was brought up. So when I told my mom what he had done that weekend, uh, she apparently told her sister because then the next time I had to go over there, and you're wondering why I had to go over there again. Mm -hmm. um, the next time I went over there, he pinned me up against the wall. And as a little kid, you're just terrified of this of man who's bigger than you. And he's got you up against the wall asking, did you tell your mother? Uh, no, no, of course, of course, I'm going to deny it. I'm a little kid. Yes. So going to minimize the pain as quickly as possible. I, absolutely. So nothing yeah. ever happened again, but 
again, you know, it was a while before I could finally ask my mom, why did you send me back into that home sure. when I had told you this? And then at that time she says, yeah, he was kind of a problem, you know, basically a problem. Like you sweep this under the rug because you don't want to make waves or, you know, ruffle yeah. peace. But it's like, where's the peace for the child in yeah. this? Just because he's a man and I'm a girl kid? Yeah. You know, so. And do you think it was, do you think that part of sweeping it on, under the rug had to do with the religious background as well? Like, uh, you know, was your mom trying to save face? Did she not want to rough pull the feathers? Did she feel out of place or unable to speak up? Do you think any of it had to do with that? Um, well, I know it's the not wanting to ruffle feathers, you know, um, yeah. I don't know if she judged that what I went through wasn't severe enough or something, you know, like as if there's levels of, like sure. I said, levels of trauma. I don't know. Um, because she knew this as a young girl, when her, this, this aunt, this sister and her husband were older than my mom. And so she would go to their house even on, you know, to help them clean, just to have a little job. Um, and she said, oh yeah, he tried to come in the bathroom to wash my back. And I went, I, I was just stunned. Sure. That there was already a pattern to this man and he was never, this was never addressed. And the children were protected, especially the girl children. I don't even know what happened to any of the boy children, the cousins sure. and stuff. But, um, you know, so that's, I don't know. He was, he was of a different faith. So I don't know anything about that. I just, I, yeah, I think it was more of a family issue there that okay. we didn't want to disturb the family. Sure. Yeah. But it was okay to disturb the kid. Yeah. And I don't think she saw it that way. I don't feel like, you know, my mom was doing what she had been taught. She was conditioned. Yep. You know, what do you talk about what you don't talk about? So I did not at all blame my mother. My mother did love me, my mother and father. I, that is not the issue at all. The issue was the teaching that she had received. And she raised me in the same manner because mm -hmm. she knew. You know, you can only do with what you have at the time. That's right. That's right. It's true. And back then, you know, it is, it was one of those things that was so much more swept under the rug. You know, it's just, it's, it's an unfortunate situation. So uh, this, this uncle then was a different denomination. Um, were you guys, did you ever find in your family that you were concerned about the souls of your other family members because they were in a different denomination. This is something that came up a lot. I, I know as growing up, you know, oh, yeah. I had grandparents who were Catholic and the others were Baptists yes. and we were, some, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. Because, you know, my dad's side of the family, we either Lutheran and Catholic and, and yeah. a couple of the other uncles that my aunts had married were, were Catholic and, and our favorite uncle was Catholic. Oh, to think that, oh, maybe he won't get to go to heaven because he's Catholic. You know, oh, yeah, you definitely have concern about that. But the upset. Yeah. 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 So you're raised in this uh, religious environment. You get to adulthood. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, becoming, you know, a woman and, and going into the world and maybe becoming a mom yourself and then deciding, like, how did you decide what sort of religion you were going to follow? Because you had, you were surrounded by so many different ones within your family. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, it, it's skin. It's a lot of that training of, you have to stay where you are because for, you know, for fear of punishment, for fear of eternal damnation. If you leave this, you're leaving the fold and you're so, you know, that was it. We stayed, I stayed where I was. Um, but, you know, all that turmoil just created so much emotional, just constantly being told no. And then when I couldn't comply, they had to put on the guilt and the shame, you know, so that it, I was coerced into compliance, you know, so that started, my body already started breaking down even as a kid, okay. 
I would have nervous tummy problems enough that I didn't go to school. So and did that start around that 10 year old I, uncle I time or I don't know. maybe it did. I, I don't really know. I just remember there were times that I would wake up and I would, my tummy would be so nervous. I just, mama would let me stay home. Hmm. And, um, you know, then it just continued to progress by high school, full blown migraines, you know, and all this time, you know, at 22, I was working, I'd gotten out of college. And I, I of course went to, um, I have a Bible degree, a, a biblical studies degree. So, I mean, even that, I mean, I know I was, I felt called into some kind of ministry when I was a junior in high school. Um, so I actually chose a, um, a Bible college, but really in the back of my mind, I chose that because I didn't think I could survive a secular campus because wow. I thought the bad guys would get me that I would lose, that I would lose my salvation. I was that feeling that shaky and that weak and fearful. It was the fearfulness that it produced. Wow. Yeah. Um, you no. Know, so I'd gone through college. I did that, graduated and I was working and I looked in the mirror one day and I saw the shadow on my neck. So I went to the doctor, well, it's a cold heart nodule in my thyroid, which had to have surgery on that. And that worked pretty well, but my migraines just continued to worsen. And I just kept thinking I was just a sickly person because I'd had, you know, after years getting, then getting married and, and having my two sons, I had miscarriages before both of them. I had, um, you know, my pregnancies were not easy at all because again, horrible migraine and all these autoimmune diseases started. Okay. And so I was just gobbling drugs from the doctors so much that, um, you know, when we got transferred to Texas, we were in St. Louis. And when we got transferred to Texas, you know, our babies were just little, they were three and five and we'd been there about a year and I was driving down a road. I knew it's our grocery store road. You know, I knew this road and driving down there with the babies in the back seat. I didn't know where I was. Wow. That's incredible. So it's like your body was holding on to a lot of fear, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of fear, potentially a lot of um, doubt, uh, worry, obviously those kinds of things. Like you were trying to bottle this stuff up and probably, you know, starting from childhood, knowing that you were wrong because you're a female and you're growing up in this sort of religious environment, then you're made even more wrong. And potentially as a, as a young girl feeling a bit uh, unclean, if you will, because of what your oh, uncle absolutely. did. Yeah. yeah. And then you're, and so, and then you're proliferating this because you're continually going back to church and you're like pushing oh, yeah. yourself to be more spiritual, to be more clean, to be more perfect. Mm -hmm. And the body's starting to go, uh-uh, yeah. I need to be paid attention to. I can't yeah, do Yeah, because this when you're told that yeah. you're, you're just full of original sin and there's no way to get this out of you, there, there, is, no, there is no love for yourself or feeling of goodness or worthiness or deservedness. It's always fear, fear, and more fear that what if I've done the unpardonable sin, you know, yeah. that's never identified. You just have <laughs> guess on it because yeah. it's never laid out. Did you do um, any of those, I, I like to call them sort of OCD type mannerisms because a, a lot of religious, uh, people coming from religious background can often end up with a type of OCD where they're constantly checking in with themselves. Am I good enough? Am I saved? You know, do I need to re oh, get re-saved? Yeah. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the nervousness within me, yeah. within my body was tremendous, you know? Uh, yeah. You're always kind of looking behind your shoulder to see if the devil's right there, you know, <laughs> he's yeah. going to trip you up or something. So it's just, it's just such a relief to be, you know, where I am now. But definitely. So you let's go then. Uh, let's go there a little bit. So you, because your body is actually kind of 
and I love this because I'm uh, used to be a health coach, but your body's sort of the one that, that drove you to um, where, you know, to, to get out of that belief system and to get out of that sort of confining experience. So tell us a little bit about, you know, you're, you're on all these medications, you're losing, you're literally losing your mind because you're not actually uh, even remembering that you're going to the grocery store mm -hmm. on roads that you've been on before. What was that sort of breaking point for you where you're like, I can't do medication and doctors anymore. I need to go see someone different. Yeah. Um, it was that day. I mean, when I pulled over in tears because I didn't really know where I was, um, I finally could get ourselves back home. Uh, the next day, I marched myself into a health food store. Never been in the health food store, but obviously, um, these drugs and surgeries and autoimmune diseases that I suffered with were not working. And I thought, I won't see my 40th birthday. I was 34. This was in 1993. And so um, uh, another homeschool mom happened to work at this health food store and she told me about it. So I marched in there. I told the owner my woes and told her to fix me. And so that beautiful woman, <laughs> set me on my path to wellness. And um, I started getting, um, the, they put me on a cleanse, a detox cleanse. Um, and the first six days I didn't have migraine. And you have to understand my migraines at that time for years had been no more than every two to three days. I could not go more than three days without 24 hours barfing up my guts, drugged out, and still trying to take care of two babies, you know, and a husband and a home. And we had moved away by that time. So I had no extended family in the area to even help. So I was on my own. So when I went to this health food store, and, you know, I, the next one, the next migraine didn't come for two weeks. I knew I was on the right path. So it was tremendous. And then of course we started some other supplements for all the other issues that I had. So that just, I'm, I'm a studier anyway. I love to do research. So just, um, you know, that opening my eyes and I was just ravenously studying alternative medicine and alternative healing practices that I bought this book and I think it was called, uh, I still have it. Um, I think it was called alternative medicine or alternative healing practices or something like that. But it was this book that had all different kinds of healing methods like crystals and chakras and feng shui and Ooh. color and sound these are sins these are total sins are in the eyes yes. of the church yes 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 and um so i was actually quite thankful i didn't even live near family who could put the kibosh on what i wanted to read and what i wanted to study so that just opened my mind to other thoughts, other ways of thinking, other belief systems, um, you know, and I stayed in, again, I still stayed because I was a good Christian. I couldn't leave that yet. So, um, you know, still continued there. So you really church hopping a bit, didn't you? Um, somewhat towards the end more so because when we were, we bought, bought our farm. We moved from Fort Worth and bought a farm out in the country. And so we'd been here for several years. And um, um, when I started thinking, why do I believe what I believe? You know, mm. because it doesn't feel good. And I think, you know, a spiritual walk should feel good. Yeah. It should bring me peace. And I never had lasting peace when I was in Christianity. It just was up and down. It was like a conditional peace. If I thought I was doing good and following the rules, then I would be peaceful and I would be happy. And then if I slipped, boom, I was in the doldrums and, and just worried, sick and you know, fearful and crying my heart out and begging for forgiveness. Um, so when I started doing that, we... We went from some church homes, different homes, and um, we were with some homeschool families that were churching at home in different places. 
um, I mean, we we visited Mennonite churches. We visited, you know, I, I mean, we're going extremes, you know. <laughs> yeah. And all the whole time you're learning about alternative health as well. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You're doing all this other sort of side study, hush, hush. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's um, opening up your whole world. Yeah. And then oh, okay. we were at one home church that was looking more into kind of messianic Christianity. And then the others wanted to look more into Judaism. So then we studied with Orthodox rabbis. The most <laughs> wonderful thing I think I ever did because it really opened my eyes to um, seeing Christianity differently. I remember as a little kid, I mean a little kid, my mom would listen to this show and it was called the, the Christian Jew Hour because he was a messianic guy. And she didn't listen to him very often because she didn't like that melding of the Judaism and Christianity kind of thing. Um, but she would listen to it. And I told her what I remember clearly standing in the dining room, talking to my mom as a little kid and said, well, we can't understand the Old Testament because we're not Jews. We don't speak Hebrew. And wow. <laughs> I think... I think I always blew my mom away with what I could come up with because um, she never really gave me answers that were, I think she just didn't know what to do with me. Because um, even in talking to my sister, you know, she said, Marianne, you were so much more spiritual, I think, than any of us. She says, I don't even think like you think. And of course, she still, you know, more follows church teachings. Um, so, you know, I was so thankful when I talked to her that she didn't turn it on me. She actually heard me. And this was, I think, one of the first times I felt like I was actually heard by a family member because uh, it, it wasn't that way when I left the church. So anyway, you know, just, just being open. So I really didn't leave the church until about my mid forties, probably. Um, and wh what was that turning point for you? Sorry, go on. Um, for me, I started studying on my own. I started studying the canonization of scriptures. That is a scary thing. <laughs> I in mean, I don't way? think out, I don't, so much is in the Catholic encyclopedia that I don't think those church fathers ever dreamed a common person would ever have access because of course they bolted, you know, the Bibles to the pulpits. Um, yeah. so that people wouldn't have access to them. So it's just, I'll teach you what you need to know. And yeah. so we need to read what some of those church fathers said about putting words in the Lord's mouth because it's good for business. And, you know, the just learning about how really uninspired the Bible really was, the way they chose. We have four uh, gospels when there were hundreds of gospels yep. that we've been chosen from it's yep. because we have four cardinal directions north south east and west that's it um there was you know revelation was in and out of the bible so many times but they couldn't decide whether it was inspired or not and then you know the 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 um um there were just so many things i studied the the sacrifices the jewish sacrifices and what they all meant and you know passover with the lord and they just weren't gelling they they're just there's so many things that are not that that do not follow um you know so I, realizing that it was a pick they like pick and chose yes. what they wanted their agenda no. So they could get this control across the globe. Absolutely. And of course they were the, you know, the, the, the winning, the, the, the men in power, they got to do that. Nobody oh. else had a voice in that. Oh, absolutely. So that starts breaking down your beliefs as well. Going, wow, this is, um, yeah. It's not quite, yeah. And then it's not loving. Yeah. 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 So when it finally came down to it, it was like, um, I just, I just really had had enough. I'd had so many run-ins with people and ministers scream at me and tell me how wrong I was and how dare you, you know, confront my authority and you have to take this on faith. And I'm thinking, no, I don't. 
There has to be a foundation for this. There has to be a reason. Um, I, I uh, you know, it, it finally just came to the point where I just said, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. And the thing was, is I realized a couple of weeks after we had left and we hadn't been in church for a couple of weeks that I hadn't cried once. When before, prior to that, crying was a daily suffering because I was in such fear and agony and shame and guilt. And so I was so at peace when I left. And it really gets you when you're a mom and your oldest son, who's a teenager, comes to you and says, you know, it just feels like a burden is lifted off my shoulders. It just yeah. broke my heart that my son, you know, felt such relief to even leave. And I hadn't even known that he was suffering. Because again, it's not because something you talk about. Right. Of course, because it's not, you're not allowed, you're not supposed to be suffering, right? Jesus is supposed to answer or God is supposed to answer all of your problems. Um, I love that you brought this up, Marianne, because I do see this across the board, myself included, the way I was raised, people I talk to in this, you know, I've been raised in the religious backgrounds, the constant underlying suffering and the desire for the constant approval that we need to have from God causes this, like, you're just always in tears. I, I know that the women that I grew up with were constantly crying. Yeah. And then I was that way as well through my twenties as well, trying to find, you know, where I fit in with how yeah. I'm going to do this whole God thing. The crying is just, like you said, it's a daily thing. And I can't emphasize that enough of that, that underlying pain and, and concern that goes on mm -hmm. and no one says anything about it. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. You know, and well, they want you to cry. You go to church so you can, they can get you to cry. <laughs> exactly. So I mean, I always judged yeah. whether a service was good or not by how long we were in the altars crying. There you go. That it says it was, all. I mean, yeah. you, you had to go longer than the church service because you had to get that, that, you know, begging for forgiveness time in. Sure. And um, I'm, it's just like, oh, I'm so free now. <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful. It's good. Now, so you left, you, your, your son gives you this experience that helps you to realize that, wow, I do have a weight. We all have, the whole family now has a weight lifted off their shoulders. Wow. So bring us now to the time. I mean, you've been reading these other texts. You're sort of learning about crystals. You're learning about spirituality. How did you start to get in touch with your own spiritual side and, and this group that you call the many? Oh, um, well, like I said, I, I guess I, we left the church when I was about in my mid forties, you know, so that's still a lot of development that, that, you know, I still studied so much because I just, I love to study. I love to find out why I just have a thirst for knowledge. And um, I, I just kept looking at other, other, even ancient texts or whatever, other traditions, ancient traditions, spiritual. And I'm thinking, you know what? There is kind of a theme. There's principles that run through each of these, you know, about your thinking. What does your thinking do? How does it affect your body? Um, Amazing, yeah. You know, so at that time, then I started looking at metaphysics, which I bought Louise Hay's book, uh, You Can Heal Your Life. And I use it regularly. Everybody get that book. Um, <laughs> because in that book, the back of her book is all the different um, body functions and parts. And, but there's also the illnesses and the disease, dis ease because there is dis-ease and imbalance in our bodies. And what emotional um, issue could have brought it about? And when I started reading that thyroid issues are because you cannot speak up for yourself. You cannot communicate your desires or wants or needs. And I was like, 
boom, I did it to myself because I was so ingrained with the, the beliefs that my voice didn't matter. Yeah. What I wanted, what I needed could not be spoken. And even, you know, different, the autoimmune, I had Graves disease. Then after that, and I had gallbladder, all these things that I know when I look at her book and look at the emotional trauma that goes with it, yeah. they just go right down the line. I mean, <laughs> I've had so many surgeries and so many parts removed. I always tell people, I'm surprised they don't rattle because, <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. I have lots of missing parts. Um, so when I started, when I started looking at that, then it just, then I realized my, my spirituality should feel wonderful. It should feel good. And so when I left the church, peace just came over me and it stayed. I didn't have to work for it. I didn't have to fret over it. I didn't have to beg for it. Yeah. It was there. It was just, it just beautiful. 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 So did you then start, did you do meditation as well? Is that how you kind of, yeah. Tell us, yes. I'm very curious about this first experience that you had with the many. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's definitely years later. Um, is it? Okay. So we're yeah. still, you still go through a massive I, I, transition. Is, <laughs> I always said, I feel like I'm on warp speed because, um, I'm transforming so much just all the time. Um, sure. I mean, I got down to my later forties and I just went, I'm not supposed to be married anymore. Okay. So I ended up leaving my husband and it took me a while to decide what I wanted in the divorce. And we did that later, but you know, in that process, you know, meeting my husband now, um, you know, just this continued growth. So we moved back to our farm. Um, I bought my ex-husband out of the farm. And so we moved in here, my, my husband now. Um, and it's so nice to have a spiritual soul partner. Yes. Because we talk constantly about spiritual things, about life things, about desires. I get to speak up. I get yeah. to have a voice. It's just glorious to have a partner that is willing to hear and listen and and help you help through that because yeah it was still I'm still working on being able to speak up for what I want um sure. but we had moved back here in 2015 and I was in my office which is a little building out front it used to be our schoolhouse and I was I had just done some yoga and I was so I was laying meditating and um, I was laying on the floor and I start, I, I say a lot of, I am affirmations, you know, you know, I am goodness, I am peace, I am love, I am. And then I started Beautiful. telling myself, I love you. I adore you. I cherish you. And I just started going through those laying on the floor. And <laughs> all of a sudden my thoughts went to, we love you. We adore you. And I, my, I remember my eyes bolted open and I sat up and I'm like, what is that? Who is we? <laughs> so, you know, again, I, you know, already knew about intuition and that kind of thing in my inner being speaking to me, but the we part was the shock. Sure. And I just kind of set it on the shelf because I didn't know what to do with it at the time. So it wasn't until, oh, uh, like maybe end of 2019, 2020, beginning of 2020, I finally started, you know, I had already been writing from my intuition. Um, but then I, I um, thought, okay, I'm going to ask whoever these guides are to talk to me. So I do a lot of journaling. I am a big proponent of journaling after our quiet mind meditation. And so I would start just asking a question. And the first time it happened, I, the first couple letters started kind of like my writing. And then all of a sudden my hand pulled really hard to the right. And I do not, I write very straight up and down. And so my hand was pulling to the right and I thought, okay, somebody's here with me. 
so exciting. It was, it was so exciting. So now it's like a, a daily thing. And, and I also offer for people to ask questions of the many. They, I asked them one day, I said, well, what do I call you? <laughs> what do I call you? What's your name? And they said, we refer to ourselves as the many because there are so many here with us that you could not think a thought or have a desire that we don't have someone here with us that's interested and can help you. Beautiful. And I was like, glory be, I'm on the right track. <laughs> I love it. That's so, so exciting. Now it's to the point where, you know, people can write in, they ask me questions, you know, that I can offer to them. And, and I give a video response actually of them talking through me. So oh. the channel of, of the many comes through. So that's, that's Interesting. a very, very fun thing. Have I, you by any chance? Oh, go on. Oh, okay. I just, I just post a lot of their messages on my on my social media. So if you ever follow me, then yes. you'll see them. You'll see them. Definitely for up for, for uplifting um, messages. Yes. From, from source, yes. definitely follow mm -hmm. you on the, uh, what social media are you on? Are you on Facebook and on everything? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Instagram, uh, cool. LinkedIn, Pinterest, yeah. it's all out there. Oh, great. I don't okay. use much Twitter, but you know, yeah, that's not, yeah. A, okay. that's not my style. <laughs> I love it. So um, have you ever, I'm just curious about this because you are um, so connected with the many and uh, have you ever read the book um, Conversations with God by Neil Don oh, Donald absolutely. Walsh? absolutely. Matter of fact, I'm reading it again right now. Oh, excellent. I love it. It was one of the books that changed my life. Um, yes. Yes. And of course, you know then about, uh, I would assume Abraham Hicks as well. Oh, absolutely. My mentor. Yeah. I love it. Beautiful. Us. Yes, I just I feel like you're in that. That's your that's your realm. Um, oh yes, yes. So. I followed Abraham for years. I mean, once I started, you know, looking at that mindset change and trying to figure out how to transform my mindset because I wanted real well being. I didn't just want to be sort of healthy with my new my natural stuff. I wanted well being. And that's when it kicked in was when I started shifting my mindset and transforming my inner being, myself, um, you know, and besides hiring coaches, I definitely look to Abraham Hicks um, for their self. Oh, yes. Conversations with God. Neil, uh, uh, I'm drawing a Neil blank. Donald Walsh. Neil Donald Walsh. Um, yeah you know, it's just mind blowing. I just, I sit there and I'm just, oh my, <laughs> another mind blowing moment. And uh, I feel like I should reread it. I bet we come, you're coming from another whole new perspective now, aren't you? Oh, it is. It's just, um, I mean, I was already thriving, but it's like, I've just been bolted again forward, you know, even more. So it's just like, uh, just, I don't know if you can thrive that. more than you thrived before. <laughs> Somehow I'm doing. Well, there's always another level. Let's that's let's see if we right. can. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So that's a beautiful story. So now you're in a an obviously very respectful, loving relationship where he holds mm -hmm. space for you, allows you to be who you are, um, challenges you, helps you again go those next levels that you're looking mm -hmm. for. Your kids and you, um, your your boys. How's your relationship with them, and you know, sort of their spirituality? Are you? Is it open? Is it good conversations or? Um. They're they're just very busy guys, so you know <laughs> they're you know one is quite a distance from us and one is um, close, but you know their families are just so busy, and I just you know hear when I hear from them they're doing good. And I just, I always just send them love and that they find their happiness and that they find their place. And, and I feel like they are, I, I just, uh, you know, in the conversations we have had, it sounds like, you know, they're doing good and I don't need to mother them. Like, yes, that. I yes. can let them be themselves. I can allow them i'm not fearful that something's oh they're gonna die and go to hell because they don't live the way i think they should now it's like i have so much freedom to allow them to be the men they want to be with their little families that 
I'm good. I'm good with yes. it. And you're not constantly like putting um, pressure on yourself to, to transform them. I love that. Yes, That's absolutely. so special. Yeah. Yeah. And Randy, my husband has um, four children. So I have just gained these beautiful bonus children that we are so close and deep conversations with some because <laughs> you know, they're younger and they're they're they come much more frequently but um just just amazing things oh my god I have so many stories just from those those kids you know the That's times so that we've spent together in deep in deep conversation about spiritual things and life transforming things Beautiful. Amazing. So tell me a little bit now. I mean, you're, you're um, obviously an oracle for the many, uh, mm -hmm. you're a spiritual guide. You um, are opening yourself up to obviously telling your story for the first time here. Um, and then also working with what you call religious refugees and helping them become spiritual supernovas. So tell me a little bit about what you do with people to help them transition a bit. Absolutely. You know, when I was looking at kind of opening this vulnerable side of me, this, I felt like this was like the last part of my life that I really had to surrender to being open to sharing. And um, when I left, I felt like a religious refugee. I felt like I was lost, that I had no home that I had nowhere to go. There was no support. Um, I was out on the wrong ragged edge of, of trying to figure it out on my own, which, you know, I, I am a strong person. So a lot of times, you know, we just keep going. And, um, and I knew there was that spiritual side to me and I wanted to thrive. I knew that being, feeling like, you know, I had to reject almost my whole life and the beliefs that I carried and incorporate new beliefs and the process of incorporating these new beliefs then, you know, transformed me, transformed my spirituality, transformed my, my intuition and then hearing from the many and just deeper and deeper growth that now I feel like, you know, I've become that spiritual supernova that explosion of brilliance that's planting more stars and sharing. And I just, I love to help those folks that feel like um, religious refugees, because okay. I know that had I had somebody like me back then, I would have transformed much more quickly. Yeah. Because I, I would have had the guidance that I didn't have that I had to find for myself. And there's no need for somebody to go through all of that. You don't have to suffer anymore. You don't have to feel like you don't know, you don't have a place to belong. Yeah. So, um, you know, starting I love that. That's, that's going to help people transform into that spiritual supernova that they know they are. Yeah. It's yeah. just that they're so closed in and don't feel like they have the support. And I want to be that support. I am that support and I'm willing to be there for you. And I love that. You've got this goodness formula and also this background because there's a lot of people that do, you know, there's a lot of therapists out there, for instance, that, that can help. I don't know if you went to any psychotherapist. I definitely did um, psychologists and those kinds of things to help me transform out of these belief systems. But what I didn't, what they didn't understand was that the religious background had such an impact on who I was that just working on the anxiety, just working on the depression, just working on these different aspects of the things I didn't like about myself. Mm -hmm. um, they just, they just didn't have that understanding. Like for instance, that you have of this, this background in religion and how you identify with it so much. And then you have to recreate a whole new identity. Yes. So Tell us a little bit about your goodness formula. Like how can someone work with you and um, what can they expect? Yeah. Well, I, the many are constantly telling me to tell them of their goodness, because I think that's one of the biggest things that was, that I had to come to terms with. Yes. That yes. I'm really innately good. I am not a worm. I am not worthless. I am not 
you know, something so invaluable um, on the face of this planet. And um, that I have goodness, that I am goodness. It's not just an attribute, it's who I am. And yeah. I help people to start remembering, remembering, remembering back all those parts that have been torn apart and disjointed and put in separate boxes. And you can't be this and you can't be that. And we blend those all back together in this fitness formula. So, um, you know, it's just step by step. It's baby steps. You're not going to, you're not going to undo, you know, a lifetime of struggle. And it's a matter of, you know, unlearning and then putting in the new things, the new beliefs that actually do support you and do, um, give you that peace and clarity and help you thrive because it's it's all about thriving we're here to to experience as much joy as possible and that's what we go for love it <laughs> that, that's that's where we need to be living i love that and knowing come again coming from that background i understand how deep inside we we how yucky we actually feel about ourselves until we find a way to um you know you know to reprogram that whole thought process so um i love that i love the tears because these are tears of joy i can tell you're extremely connected to helping people in this way so absolutely beautiful yes, yes. is there any yeah is there anything else marianne that you want to add to our chat today um where can people find you What's the best way? Well, to of course, I, you know, I always welcome everybody to visit my website, maryannpack.com. And I have a, you know, if you're, if you're feeling like a, if you've left the church or you're on the verge, you're ready to go and you haven't stepped across the line, you know, I'm not encouraging you to leave. I want you to be at peace and do what brings that peace. Um, because we all have to make that decision in our own time. But if you're feeling like a religious refugee, you've dealt with gaslighting, you've dealt with being shunned, you feel felt ostracized, you don't feel like you fit in anymore. It's just like the church hasn't moved into the 21st century and you have, you know that life should be happy and should be inclusive and should be um, loving and you're not seeing that. So you feel like a religious refugee. There is hope. There is so much hope for thriving. You know, you'll see the possibilities. You'll feel that promise and you'll realize it. Um, and that's what I want to, that's what I want to do with this goodness formula that everybody can be in that thriving with that joy that I know is to be us, is us. We are source in the flesh, we are God in the flesh. The goodness is there. It's who we are. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that. Thank you so much, Marianne. I think that this is a special message. I think this is really important for people to hear. Um, you know, and, and we all love to know when we're working with someone like yourself, we all love to know your background as well. So thank you for sharing it today um, and speaking up and speaking out uh, around taboo topics that, you know, we haven't been allowed to up until now. So. Thank you so much. Oh, I thank you, Stevie. Thank you so much for joining us and, and, and helping me share my message because that's really important. It's, you know, um, you know, I, I tell stories in my writings, but it's always a little different to, to hear an interview in this way. Um, um, you, you get to hear the emotion. You get to feel what I feel and, um, and feel the joy at the end. So it's, it's all, it's all there ripe and ready for you. So, um, and, and what is your website? It, if people enjoyed this, this uh, interview, how can people find you? Well, um, mine is stevienoah.com. And so uh, if you do have a background in a religious upbringing, that's who I work with as well. Um, I do a little bit different uh, type of thing that Marianne does. Mine's more focused on getting you those practical skills because I was a homeschooled um, kid. We'll tell my story another time, but I know what it's like to 
get released into the world and have terrible decision-making skills, yes. bad relationships, all that sort of thing. Obviously my, you know, self relationship, all that th stuff. So I like to utilize um, more of an NLP and a life coaching and hypnotherapy approach to helping people really get on their feet and, and yeah, start their life and move into a new direction in that way. So it's stevienoa.com. Thank you, Marianne. Yes. And I'll put that in the description and the, the process she's talking about is NLP is neuro linguistic programming. So yes. it's another, um, really good energy tool to, to shift. Yes. To make shift the big energy. body mind transformations. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I love NLP too. I think it's a very profitable it's a great and tool. great tool, great tool to use. So I appreciate you, Stevie. Thank you Thank so you. much. It's been my pleasure, Marianne. Thank you. Happy to help. Absolutely. Um, and thank you everyone for sharing this episode with us here at Dynamic Thriving Podcast. And please do visit our website, maryannpack.com um, for all of our offers. We have a Discover Your Joy and Wellbeing call that is a complimentary call if you would like to find out a little bit more if you are feeling like a religious refugee and you know yourself to be a spiritual supernova, you know that's who you should be. Um, we'll walk you through that. So um, join me there on maryannpack.com. And as always, if you really enjoyed this, please like, comment, and be sure and subscribe to our podcast. It really expands our work into the world and I appreciate it. And remember, you are joy looking for a way to express. <laughs>